Please be seated. Uh, I've missed that singing, and uh, we've almost forgotten the songs too. It's only been two weeks, three weeks. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. This is probably where I should have started this series if I'd known I'd be going this long. Uh, but uh, Joshua chapter 1, I'm going to read the first 10 verses. First 9 verses, sorry. <clears throat> After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the, all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all that all the law which Moses my servant commanded you, do not turn from it to the, right hand, to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, it, uh, meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Moses died, and God gives Joshua an invitation and a commission. What is not written here is all the history, because the history is all the previous books prior to Joshua, and we don't have time to go through all that history, but essentially God brings Israel out of Egypt, as we read in his word, it says, with his mighty hand. He freed them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and in, they come to the wilderness, to the desert, and it was only a short trip into the promised land. But a lack of faith meant they did not, or were not able to enter the promised land, and so they're stuck in the wilderness for 40 years. And now they're looking to come into the promised land. This is after 40 years in the wilderness. And to lead him into the promised land is Joshua. This is the second time, the first time because of a lack of faith, they couldn't enter. A second time now, and they still require faith to enter the promised land. The plan for them was not to stay in Egypt, nor was the plan for them to die in the wilderness. Anyone over the age of 20, when they came out of Egypt, when they first came to cross the Jordan River to enter the promised land, passed away. So there were many older people around. So the plan wasn't for them to stay in the wilderness. The wilderness was a place of limbo. That's where they were stuck. But that's not where, they, where God wanted them. The whole plan was to bring them to the promised land, to give them a new life in the promised land. As it's written, the land of milk and honey, with all the blessings that God would provide for them in this promised land. And that promised land was across the Jordan, on the other side of the Jordan River. And it required faith to help them get across this Jordan River, to enter this new land where God would provide everything that he promised them. This was the land of their dreams. They've been looking forward to this point in time, the history, to have their own land, the land they would call their home, their land. And that's where, uh, that's where their mind was, to get to this land. Unfortunately, the history was that they were stuck in the wilderness, and many of them passed away in the wilderness. And you know, many people are like that. There's... Yeah, we begin our life uh, with a lot of dreams and ambitions and then comes this thing called age and maturity and if your dreams and your ambitions get pushed out even further into the distance a lot of the time and sometimes you think, am I ever going to achieve any of my dreams, my goals and my ambitions? And sometimes you are able to achieve them and you think, is, you know, is that what it was all about? 
you know, it's a bit of a letdown, an anticlimax, because you thought you know, you'd feel something a bit more than what you do. And so this thing called age creeps in, and then we realise after a while, man realises that there's got to be more to life than just all these things that we look forward to in this life. There's got to be more to life than just all the stuff we surround ourselves with, all the things that we set our eyes on. And they hear on one side, man hears on one side God calling him to come to him and receive life from him in Jesus Christ. And on the other hand, all the attractions of the world saying, that stuff is for people who can't cope with reality. Just come and join us and experience. This is what life is all about. Just experience it and that's what it's all about. And they get stuck in this place in between. What they know is utter hopelessness and aimlessness in life. And on the other side, what they know is something that God is supposed to offer, which is a new life with purpose and meaning and all the rest of it. But that step actually requires a bit of faith to accept into my heart, into my life. And so they're stuck in this wilderness, this space in between the two. They can't go backwards because they know there's nothing behind them. They're too afraid to go forwards. And they say, well, it's better to stick with what I know than the potential of something I have no idea what this God is and what religion is and all this other stuff that I'm confronted with. And the conviction of the truth in their hearts prompts them to consider at least the possibility that they should go to God. But the pull on the other side is, are you sure this is what you want to do? You know, look at all those crackpots that end up in churches, cults and all the rest of it, and the narrative of the world really feeds into that. And yet that's exactly what God calls us to do, to trust him with our lives and to come out of the rubble of this world and to find life in Jesus Christ. Come to me. All you who are weary and tired and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The place of the promised land was called the land of rest for the Jews. And he calls us to come to a land of rest. And so that's all the history, and that's how we fit into this story of the Israelite nation that God's calling us today, by faith to enter a new life. Now, this story opens up, this passage opens up with the words, after the death of Moses. And so Joshua now is leading the Israelite nation and we read the first nine verses and you can't escape all the times God says to Joshua, be not afraid, be of good courage, do not be dismayed, focus on my word, I'll be with you like I was with Moses, be encouraged, be not afraid, not discouraged. And you can't help understanding from that that there was a problem uh, that Joshua had in this position that he finds himself in, uh, it looks like he was, had a lot of fear and a lot of insecurity, doubts about how he was supposed to lead these people. Because, you know, till now, well, God spoke with Moses and Joshua uh, lived with Moses's, uh, within Moses' shadow. And let's make no mistake, Joshua was a man of faith in the last chapter of Deuteronomy. It actually tells us that people recognised in Joshua a spirit of wisdom and faith. And they looked at Joshua the way they looked to Moses. So the people saw in Joshua what they expected to see in their leader, but Joshua didn't see that in himself. And he looks like he was rather afraid. And it's not surprising because in terms of wisdom and life experience and uh, whatever else comes with age, well, the only two elderly people, if you can call them that, that come out of the wilderness was Joshua and Caleb. Well, their peers died because of their lack of faith. They're the only two that came. And he watched Moses, and he saw Moses, and he followed Moses, and he saw that when Moses prayed, he would win the battle. And when Moses' hands got tired, they had to prop them up again, so he would still win the battle. So he could see all these things, but now Moses was gone. And now he has to carry the great responsibility, that's how he feels, and he's afraid because God's plans didn't stop with Moses' departure. God's plans never stop. And so Moses is gone. Joshua feels a weight of responsibility. And as important as Moses was to the story and the life of Israel, um, and as important as uh, people are to the story and the life of this church and in various uh, spheres in life, it wasn't about Moses and it wasn't about Joshua. Uh, and what laid ahead still was the promise of God that he was going to take the Israelite nation into their promised land. Now, this was a work that God was going to do. They haven't crossed over yet. And he feels a sense of responsibility here. And he's a bit afraid. He's a bit worried. 
Uh, but it's not about Moses and it's not about Joshua. It's about God. God doing his work and fulfilling his promises in the life of his people. And it's not about us or people that we put on the pedestal. We often put people on the pedestal. It's about God doing his work in his church to fulfill his promise in his word that each of us may come to an understanding, a deeper understanding of Jesus Christ and what it means to be a child of God, what it means to live the new, in newness of life, what it means to have this new life that God promises each of us that come to him and can to continue that work and be a witness to the world around us of this work of God to build up his church and to bring people to an understanding not to look to the darkness of this world but to look with hope to what Jesus Christ offers. And it's a work about which God has a lot of desire and does it with a lot of hope and with a lot of anticipation that's on God's side. That's how he does this work. And we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God. That's Peter talking about God. His desire is that all come to repentance. And he's not slack concerning his promise. He's coming, but he's waiting because he doesn't want anyone to not grab a hold of this promise and not become a child of God, not experience this new life. And the question this morning is, is he waiting for any of us? Have we experienced this newness of life that God's word promises? All those that come to Jesus Christ. Is God saying this morning, no, no, not yet. There's one more person at Peel Street. There's one more person I'm waiting for. Because he's opened the door for new life. And he's opened the door through Jesus Christ. Don't sit in the wilderness, a place of meandering, going around in circles. If you haven't yet given the life to Jesus Christ, come to him and receive life from him and experience the joy that comes from having a living relationship with God. So Moses had died. Joshua feels a weight of responsibility. He feels it on his shoulders, and yet it's God's work. God's doing all this in the background. Why did God wait for Moses to die before he gives Joshua this invitation and his great commission to arise and stand and cross over the Jordan? Why does he wait for Moses to die? You get this sense that you know, he says here, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. You, know, you think proper planning, succession planning is, well, let's bring them into the promised land, let's cross over the Jordan River and then Moses can take the back seat for a while and then uh, Joshua can leave from there. That's how we think. You know, that would be, uh, that would be less risky than uh, putting it all on Joshua and all the people now to look at this new leader they have. Um, you know, they looked to Moses because uh, Moses was their leader. He was the one that held the law for them, got the law from God. And so much they looked forward to in Moses. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't have been better if uh, Moses was still around and Joshua took over later. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan. I can't escape this question. Why did God wait for Moses to die before he calls Joshua to arise? Everyone was looking forward to this point in their history to go. And God's word really gives us two answers to this question. And they're related. The first is because, well, Moses had disobeyed God. Remember, he was supposed to hit the rock, and he hit the rock, and water came out, he hit it a second time. And then, one point, God says, now speak to the rock, and water will come out, because the Israelites needed water. And instead of speak, speaking to the rock, he hit the rock. And from a human perspective, you can understand this. You know, if you tap the rock and water comes out, that's good. If you tap the rock and no water comes out, well, you don't look like a fool. But if you say to the rock, water come out, and it doesn't come out, then you look like a fool, don't you? So it's, not, it's less risky to hit the rock than to speak to the rock. And yet as a result of this, uh, this action of Moses, God says in Deuteronomy 32, you will see the land, but you will not enter it, because you didn't give glory to me in obeying me. So there's a wonderful lesson here about robbing God of his glory and how we, when we obey God, we give honour to God. And a very difficult lesson here for Moses 
that on this one thing that he disobeyed God, he didn't listen accurately to what God said, that he didn't enter the promised land. But this really also feeds into the second reason, or the second answer, why did Moses die before God says to Joshua, arise and enter, cross the Jordan and enter. See, looking back from the New Testament, it's easy to see this pattern emerging. Uh, I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, but at the time, it was probably difficult for the Israelites to understand, and probably still difficult for the Israelites to understand uh, why this happened. The Jews refer referred to the law of God as the law of Moses. And we see that in the New Testament. You know, Moses gave us this and gave us the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses and the law of Moses. Uh, so Moses represented the law that was given on two stone tablets on Mount Sinai. And that law that was given to Moses demonstrates God's perfect holiness in contrast to man's sinfulness. Romans 3.23, For we'll all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And a bit later on in Romans 7.7, 7, Paul says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. And he's asking the Christian with a perspective. If the law shows us to be sinners, well, the law is bad, isn't it? He says, certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. In other words, the law was given, and all of a sudden I, think, I, I see in myself that I'm not keeping the law, therefore I'm a sinner before God. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said, thou shalt not covet. I wouldn't know what I was doing was wrong if the law wasn't given, because the law was given and says, what you're doing is wrong. Thou shalt not steal. All of a sudden, stealing is wrong. They shall not bear false witness. False lying is wrong. And so the law was given, and it was a temporary instructor for man, uh, and it had to come to an end. And it revealed to man the huge gap between his sinfulness and God's holiness. At the same time, it reveals to man, it reveals to us how the holy God wants to enter into a relationship with sinful man, but can't because of sin. It revealed also that we were held prisoners because of sin, condemned to eternal hell. And Paul says in Galatians 3, 21, Is the law then against the promises of God? So if God's law condemns us as being lawbreakers, sinners before God, well, you know, God also has these wonderful promises. Now we can't have the promises because we're sinful and we break God's law. Is, is, a, is the law against the promises of God? You know, what has God done here? And Paul says, certainly not. For if there had been a law which could, have been, which, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. So now he goes a bit further to say to us, and just follow me here, it's a little bit complicated, complex. He goes a bit further to say to us, that if there was a law that could be given to us, and in keeping that law we would be righteous before God, that's great, because then through the law we would become righteous. But what he's really saying is the law can't make you righteous, can't make me righteous. The law actually shows a standard that it's impossible for me to keep. And he goes on to say, but the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The law, he says, was given to reveal our sinfulness and God's holiness and to help us to realise that we can't approach God through the law. We don't have any hope of approaching God via the law. We can't keep the law. And to show to us that when Jesus Christ came, it's through Jesus Christ now that we can approach God and be one with God through Jesus Christ. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the, the faith, which would afterward be revealed. And so while the law couldn't deal with our sinfulness, couldn't make us better people, it would show us how bad we were, but couldn't make us better people, it opened the way for salvation when Jesus Christ came. To shadow us how far we were from God. And how now through Jesus Christ, we can come into a living relationship with God. And so, the weakness in God's law, and I don't like using that expression, as given by Moses, was that it relied on our ability to live a holy life. Well, we know what the problem with that is. We're weak and we can't live to that standard that God wants. Moses betrayed the law, this holy law of God that did not lead to life, but led to condemnation. And Moses failed that very standard of God in his own life when he 
hit the rock rather than spoke to the rock and disobeyed God. And so Moses failed the very standard and did not enter the promised land because of God's law. Romans, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. You do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What the law could not do, Paul is saying, in a lot of words, Jesus Christ did. The condemnation that we carried because we were lawbreakers, sinners before God, Jesus Christ took upon himself and he died in order that we might live. And so what we have here is a grateful heart. What we should have here is a grateful heart to God that didn't hold, didn't hold us accountable before the law, but gave to us Jesus Christ. And in accepting Jesus Christ, our personal saviour, we receive forgiveness from sin, of the sin in our lives, but more than that, we also receive power to live the life that God demands of us. So we thank God for Jesus Christ, for helping us escape the condemnation of sin and giving us a new life. So Moses had to pass away under the law, which he himself failed, failed to keep. And this allowed Joshua, whose name is Yahweh, is salvation. God is salvation. This allows Joshua now to come and to lead the Israelite nation, not because they were good law keepers, elsewhere in the Old Testament, we read how terrible they were in the wilderness. And they carried all these false, God when, false gods with them when God was helping them cross through the wilderness and providing manna for them and giving them all that they needed. So, the, so it's no coincidence here that Joshua is leading them into the Promised Land, not Moses, allowing them to enter the promised land because of their faith in God, not because they kept the law. It's no coincidence here that God says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. And all this points to the wonderful grace of Jesus Christ, God, of God, that was demonstrated to us on the cross through Jesus Christ, who took our place on the cross, not only to forgive us, but also to bring us, to deliver us into a new life, a life that God has prepared for us, a life that reflects the glory of God within our own lives. And this is not based on our ability to keep the law or some new set of rules. We're not given a new set of rules, the New Testament rules. This is based on our ability to allow God to transform us from the inside, to live the life that he wants us to live. And while Christian life means obedience to the principles that we have in God's word and the commandments that we have in God's word. It's much more than that. If that's all it was, then God's word would still stand to condemn us. But with the rebirth, the new heart that we receive when we give our hearts to Jesus Christ, that regeneration that works on the inside transforms us and helps us to live this new life that Jesus Christ expects of his children. What we read in the New Testament, the newness of life. To be obedient to God. And not to constantly be hounded by the Lord as saying you fall short. But to have the power within us to live this new life that God wants from his children. God asks us today to leave the wilderness, to cross the Jordan and to enter into the new life that he has prepared for us. And this is a message that we give anyone that doesn't know Jesus Christ, to come to Jesus and receive forgiveness and a new life, a transformed life. But it's also an important message for us who've given our hearts to Jesus Christ to remember we're not in the wilderness. We've been called to a new life and to take heart because Jesus Christ has given us the power to live that new life. Simply knowing we're sinners or trying harder is not the exit solution from the wilderness. I'm going to try harder next time. I'm not going to do this the same thing, that's not the secret. The secret is in submitting our lives to him and living with faith in Jesus Christ and allowing him to do what he wants to do in our lives to make us more Christ-like every day. And this new life that we're given, in fact, there's two parts to the promise. We're reading Joshua in verse 2, the last part. 
uh, to go to the land which I am giving them. So there's a part that he was going to give them. Go to the land which I am giving them. And then if you go to verse 3 and it says, For every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. So it's already been given. And we understand this better in the next chapter when Rahab, who took, on, took in the two spies, she confesses to them and says to them, When we heard you crossed over the Red Sea and you came across, we knew in our hearts, we knew in our hearts that God had given you this land. So all the people around them knew what was happening. But the Israelites, because of lack of faith, did not know what was happening. The new life he's giving us, he's already, in fact, given it to us. We have it. In Joshua, sorry, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 and 4, we've been covering this on Wednesday nights. Listen to what Peter says about this new life, the promise given and the promise received. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Note those words. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life, this life as we know it, to be able to live our lives, and to godliness, to be able to live the spiritual life, the holy life that he wants us to live. His divine power has given us all of this. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which he has given us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may, be, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Think about those words. The great promises of God through his word that we, sinful people, broken people, can be partakers of of God's divine nature. That we will become Christ-like. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in us to make us Christ-like. A work that began the day we gave our hearts to Jesus Christ, that continues, but is ours to claim, is ours to accept. And we accept it by faith. This is the work of salvation in us. This is what God was trying to teach the Jews. I've given you this land I'm giving you this land, but I've actually I've already given it to you. You didn't accept it 40 years ago. Accept it now by faith. So just forgiveness of sin. But we read here in Peter, the divine power that has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And to be able to work within us, to produce in us the character of Jesus Christ. And this is all, well, theoretically, theologically. How do we apply it in our lives today? How do I live this life that Christ wants of me today? A victorious life, a life that's full of his blessings and his promises. God says here to Joshua in verse 5, No man shall be able to stand against you. You know, I dream of that day when I'm not afraid anymore as a Christian to live my life. Whatever happens in the world around me, and I know that should be the state that we find ourselves in. Not to be concerned what's going to happen with my kids, with grandkids, if you've got grandkids. What's going to happen with this and that and the other. And how all the demonic stars are aligning themselves today. And we're seeing the preparation of the coming of the Antichrist in all, everything that's happening around us. How people used to fight against government interference and now we just accept it. And this is not the coronavirus problem. This is something that's working in the background everywhere. It's been working for a long time to accept, to prepare the way for the coming of the Antichrist. I'd like to be able not to be afraid of that, not to be concerned about any of that. So when God says here to Joshua, no man shall be able to stand against you, well, that's great because you know, Paul says, if we're in Christ, who can be against us, right? But that's not what God is saying here to Joshua. He's not saying to him, no one shall stand against you. He's saying to him, no one shall be able to stand against you. The outcome was assured, but they still had to reckon with an enemy in that land. And the outcome for us is assured, but we still have to reckon with the enemies that we face today. And those enemies come in different levels. New life was theirs, but it wouldn't be without conflict. While victory is ours in Jesus Christ, we're reminded by God's word in Peter, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour, whom he may devour. 
That's a reality we live with. We don't shut our eyes and say, praise God, everything's well in my life. We can shut our eyes and rest in God and trust in God and live the life God wants us to live, knowing that our lives are in his hands and that whatever comes, we'll be able to face it because he who gave us the promise will stand by us. It doesn't mean we're not going to have difficulty in life. In fact, in Ephesians, Paul says the words about being ready because we're surrounded by the darkness and the principalities of powers, uh, the principalities of darkness and all the wickedness in heavenly places. We've got to put the whole armour of God on so we may be able to stand that day. No one shall be able to stand against you. That we may be able to stand that day when it comes. So all this is a promise and also a reminder to us of a warning that life in Christ is a new life. It's a blessed life. And that we accept through faith in the promises of what God gives us in his word. And ideally, we'd like God to come in and wave his hand and get away with all the difficulties we're going to face in life. But he's not going to do that. What he's told us is, you'll be able to stand. That whatever comes against you, you will be able to stand. And that's what we have to place our trust in. That we can stand because of Jesus Christ. And not to get overwhelmed by everything that's happening around us, but to trust in him. So God's word brings us back to reality, that our world is broken. It is without God. Our sinful nature works against us and looks for an opportunity to rear its head. And the lure of sin around us works in the same direction. And our battle is against the rulers and the darkness of this age. That God, God's word tells us that. But at the same time, Paul says in Romans 3, verse 9, 31, sorry, Romans 9, verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am, neither pers for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor pres things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What wonderful words to those who place their trust in Jesus Christ. That all these things that we're going to face in life, we're going to face them all, cannot separate us from the true home that's waiting for us. And that true home is not just newness of life here. That true home is eternal glory that Jesus Christ has prepared for each of us. And that's what we should keep our eyes on. That day when we see our Saviour, face to face, welcoming, welcoming us into his glory. And to get to that place of rest, to get to that glorious place, there's a life that we have to live through now. And there's a life that we are called to stand, to stand there's an enemy that we're called to stand before now and live faithfully in the presence of that enemy, the enemy of our soul. And we're not going to do that by closing our eyes and pretending he's not there. We're not going to do it by hiding we often say at home with the kids, I hope they don't mind saying it, what happens if this happens and what happens if that happens and what if the Antichrist comes? We'll go to the camp, we'll go to Walkville, we'll hide there. You can't hide, we can't hide. No one can hide from what's coming. But we can be safe in Jesus Christ, knowing that neither death nor life can separate us from him. What does that mean, neither death nor life? We think of life being great. But life actually separates us from him as well. Neither death nor life can separate us from him. Jesus Christ's invitation and commission to us today is to arise and live a life of faith. And know that we're going to face difficulties, but not to be overwhelmed, not to be discouraged, and not to listen to distorted theology that says, Satan, claim it, you'll be fine. 
but to listen to what Jesus Christ tells us. To listen to God's word, which says, you're going to face a lot of difficulties. But all these things just remind us that we're separated from him. And one day we'll be in his presence, enjoying his glorious presence, in the presence of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And that's who we have to keep our eyes on. To the Israelites, it wasn't to keep their eyes on Moses. To Joshua, get out from under Moses' shadow. You've got to live this life. And the Israelites have to live this life because this is the work that I'm doing in your lives. And that's the work that God is doing in our lives. Preparing us and directing us and pointing us to eternal glory that's waiting for those who place their trust in Jesus. May God bless his word in our hearts and give to each of us according to our needs. Amen.